Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our theme is listening to God and in these programs we've looked at the foundation of prophetic listening in the Old Testament and seen how it applies to us in the New Testament because it is very similar to the prophetic process. There were prophets in the Old Testament and we see prophets in the New Testament but as believers we have the Holy Spirit living in us so we too can hear the Word of God, we too can learn to listen to God because the Holy Spirit who lives in us will illuminate to our hearts a word from Scripture. He'll confirm that word within us. He will even illustrate it to us as he shares God's words with our hearts personally. And the Holy Spirit helps us apply the word of God. But all this is based on the Scripture. It's not a word from outside of Scripture. God speaks to us through his written word, through the Scriptures which means we must judge everything that we believe to be the Word of God from the Scriptures. Now we're going to see how this prophetic role develops in our lives as believers. Hello and welcome back to the Sword of the Spirit series, Listening to God. And throughout this series, we're trying to present to you truths from the Word of God that combine the understanding of God's Word with the experience of God's Spirit. And we're coming right now to the point where we're looking at how the prophetic anointing affects our lives. And in the last session, I gave you three ways in which this does affect us. It is the fact that we are called to be a prophetic people. It is also that we are called to have a prophetic anointing and some are called to minister as prophets as well as in the gifts of prophecy and the other revelation gifts. So we're going to see first of all that we have a prophetic function to fulfill. And every believer is called to this function. It affects every area of our lives. And this has to do first of all with our intimate relationship with God. And it involves prophetic listening. Really, that's the heart of what I'm saying in this course on listening to God. And it is therefore the only reliable foundation for all our speaking and for all our serving. In every one of these sort of the spirit manuals, this principle of prophetic listening comes into force. It's at the foundation of all that we are and all that we experience in the things of God. In the manual, Worship in Spirit and Truth, we establish that all our prayer, praise and worship and our service to God has a prophetic dimension. Even though it's Godward, it's still a prophetic dimension. In reaching the lost, we see that our testimony to the lost is to be declared in prophetic power, inspiration, and in miraculous confirmation as signs follow the preaching of the Word of God. In living faith and ministry in the Spirit, in those manuals, we note how prophetic words Words of faith come as God speaks to us about certain situations that need to be changed and we're able to speak to our mountains and tell them to be removed. And in ministry in the Spirit, how we are anointed to make prophetic pronouncement over the lives of people, be healed in the name of Jesus, be set free, and so forth. In one sense, the very existence of the Christian community is a prophetic sign of the kingdom. The existence of the church points to the coming of the kingdom and then also to the coming of Jesus Christ. In the series, The Rule of God, we know how in the Sermon on the Mount is, we see the manifesto of the kingdom of God as Jesus tells us to be salt and light. This is the prophetic role of believers in society, to be salt and light, prophetic pictures which reveal to us the marks of the church, the kingdom of God. And also we see that we are sent out as lambs amongst wolves, so these three pictures today illustrate the whole of our vital role as 
prophetic people in the world today. Salt, light, and lambs. Salt. You are the salt of the world, Jesus said. This shows us that the entire church has a prophetic function to fulfill in what we may call purification, social purification. We are the salt of the earth. In other words, salt which is used for flavoring, and in Jesus' day it was used as a preservative too to stop decay and to purify what had been decayed. We see that we are called in this prophetic role of the church to preserve society and to prevent society from decaying and also at times purifying society from what already has become decadent. And so this shows that we must be involved in society. We must be out there acting as salt right where it's needed. Salt is no good in the salt cellar. Salt has to be poured out upon the meat that it is preserving, poured out upon the food that it is flavoring. So that means we don't huddle together. We are a prophetic people who also go out into the world to witness for Christ and to act as salt. And so we have something very, very significant to fulfill in our prophetic function, our prophetic role as the people of God. Next, light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And this also should suggest to us that our prophetic function is to bring illumination and revelation in the world. You know, when you go to a, Christ, uh, to a country which has no Christian influence at all, you know you're walking into darkness. There's a darkness in the heavenly realms. There's an oppression. There's a bondage there. But if you go to a nation where there is a revival, that the heavens are light, there is a glorious sense of the presence of God. And even in the shops and in the places of business and industry, there's a godliness around the place. There's a light. There's an illumination. The darkness has been dispelled. And so we are called to act as salt and as light in our society. The best way that we can shine is through our good works and through the witness of Jesus. Jesus said, let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so we go out with a prayerful attitude, witnessing for Jesus, proclaiming his love and his light and his truth, and then living out the gospel, being good news right where we are in society, in, in our communities. We need people acting as salt and light in every part of society, in business, commerce, industry, medicine, in our homes, in our communities, in the arts and television, in politics, everywhere we need Christians who will function as salt and as light in our community. But Jesus warns us also that as we do this, we will become like lambs amongst the wolves. Now that sounds like a very frightening picture because a lamb in the middle of a pack of wolves isn't going to last any longer than a snowball in the middle of, Sah of the Sahara. And so you say, what does this mean? Well, it means you're going to be persecuted, yes, but it also means God will take care of you. Jesus here is speaking about your attitude. We are going to conquer the world through the spirit of the Lamb. That's how Jesus did it. He came as a lamb. He is the lion, but he came as the lamb. It was the lamb that was slain. It was his meekness and his willingness to submit to the Father's will for his life that brought the great prophetic transformation of the world when Jesus died on the cross. This speaks to us about the servant nature of us as prophetic people. The prophet, mighty in word and deed, Jesus of Nazareth, was also the Lamb of God. And we are called to bring his kingdom as lambs. Changing the picture slightly, but still making the same point. Isn't it remarkable how Jesus came into Jerusalem as the king, riding on a donkey? A picture of humility. A picture, similar picture to that of the Lamb. Meekness humility. And so, when we go out into the world, we are lambs, which means we lie down like a lamb. That means we don't growl like a wolf. He, we, we are to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. We are to be like lambs. And so this means that we don't go out to seek to dominate or to influence by worldly means or by forceful means. No. We allow God's kingdom to work, the principles of love 
and light. And so, the moment we begin to assert ourselves in the wrong spirit, then we are going to be defeated. But when we come against the world in the opposite spirit, we come against the wolf spirit with the lamb spirit. The lamb defeats the wolf every time. That's what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. When you turn the other cheek, it shows the other person's behavior for what it really is. But when you respond and you give back what you got from somebody else, then you are manifesting the same spirit that they have. And you are not going to overcome that. But the only way you overcome the opposite spirit is by moving in the opposite spirit. The only way you overcome the demonic spirit and the satanic spirit is by the Holy Spirit who came upon Jesus as a dove who came upon Jesus who was the Lamb. This means, too, that our function as a prophetic people will be to bring reconciliation amongst the people of God and beyond the people of God. We stand for truth and reconciliation. And this is very important because when we are calling people to repentance, we are calling them to reconciliation. Get right with God and one another. And it's no good just saying get right with God and ignore one another. Because when we are working and living together and demonstrating the love of Jesus, that's when the world will begin to believe. Because Jesus said, I pray that they may be one, that the world may believe. In other words, when we are in relationship with one another, walking together, working together, witnessing together, then the testimony comes out and it's very, very strong. It also means that the gospel message, which is about the Prince of Peace and reconciliation, then when we demonstrate prophetically what reconciliation is in the body of Christ and beyond, just have a quick look around the people here because you are a prophetic uh, demonstration right here and now. We have people from many different races, many different nations, ages, sizes, shapes, and all the rest of it Colors, temperaments, and all the rest of it. Just keep, don't look into the, don't have to look at the camera. The camera will be looking at you. It's all right. Okay, I, I know you want to. Everybody, you can look to this camera. Look to this camera here and let them give a good look at you. And you see, you really are. You really are. Go on, have a look. Go on, have a look. Have a look at this camera. Look at the people who are watching right now. There you are. Have a look into this camera and have a look at the people who are watching you. And you can see. And uh, there you are. Now listen. Okay, you can come back to me now. All right. I wanted that because that you have just made a prophetic statement. We are black. We are white. We are young. We are old. We are all shades of the rainbow. We are all ages. We are of both sexes here today. And we are all one in Christ Jesus. The world knows nothing about this unity. And there isn't even, as it were, a complete representation of our church, London City Church, in this gathering today. There are many of them. But in our London City Church gatherings, we are over 110 different nationalities. They're one of the most multicultural, multiracial congregations I know in all the world. And we are a statement. Do you know politicians are asking the questions? How can you people do this? They're asking the question. Because we are a prophetic demonstration of the reconciliation that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's give him the praise for that. Also, our prophetic role is to witness to the justice of God and the compassion of God. We must be involved in social issues which are to do with justice, care for the poor, look for the needy, speak up for those who are weak, those who are disenfranchised, those who have no voice. We must speak up on behalf of them right across the world in whatever society or culture. That's a prophetic statement. Also, as prophetic people, we will witness to God at national level. We should be prayerfully listening for, to the Holy Spirit as to what he would have to say to us about the nation as a prophetic people in our prophetic role. Remember that the real enemy is Satan and death. Those are the only two real enemies that we read about in the Bible. Satan and death. People are not. No, 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 not really. Your brother is never your enemy. 
And really, flesh and blood is not your enemy. We don't wrestle against people with bodies. We wrestle against principalities and powers. So the only two enemies, really, that we have are, are Satan and death, and both are defeated in the name of Jesus Christ. This is a prophetic ministry today. We should not be attacking people, whoever they are. Throughout the history of the church, we have shameful things for which we need to come and ask for forgiveness. For example, the church, down through the years, have attacked the Turks, the Jews, themselves in the Anabaptists, the Lollards, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Methodists, the Negroes, the Americans, the Communists, and so on, so on, so on. We to stop attacking people. People are not the problem. It's the, the real enemy is the devil. And we should use our spiritual weapons of love and reconciliation and peace in order to see this happen. And we will not fulfill it unless we adopt our servant role with total integrity. And what is the servant role? Jesus said, I have come, not that you might be ministered to, not that I might be ministered to rather, but that you may be ministered to. I have come to minister to you. And he says, when you go out, you go out as servants. Instead of just saying, we're going to take our cities, we're going to save our nation, we're going to take our nation, we should be saying, we're going to serve our cities. And we're going to serve our nation. So it's not, this prophetic role is not about standing up there thundering thunderbolts from heaven. The world will not be changed by aggression, aggressive people. All aggressors can do is change the maps. That's all they can do. They can change the borders. They can't change the world. Only love can change the world. Only a prophetic people who have the love of God and who are willing to serve and to bless the nations. It will not be changed by an aggressive political church using aggressive political means and weapons it will, or military means or weapons. It will be changed by a serving church. So we will serve by us by our praying, by interceding, and by our biblical actions. This prophetic church will serve by intercession. That's how we will demonstrate our prophetic role. And we've seen, as we've studied prophecy in the Old Testament, prophecy in the New Testament, Jesus' life and ministry, the prophecies concerning him, his fulfillment of those prophecies, as we, studied, as we have studied all these things, we have seen that central to the ministry of the prophetic is the ministry of intercession. And if you are a prophetic people, you must be a praying people. Now, we come to look at the prophetic gift in our lives. How can we function in this gift? In one of the earlier sessions, I laid the foundation by describing briefly the gift of prophecy as found in 1 Corinthians. But now we need to see how does this apply to us. First of all, all believers may, as the Holy Spirit leads, from time to time, exercise the gift of prophecy. It's a particular manifestation of the Spirit which is given to particular people on particular occasions for particular purposes. And it's not something that you, you possess. You've got it here, you bring it into the meeting, you bring it out with your Bible and say, okay, there's my Bible and there's my prophetic gift and there we are. You need to depend on the Holy Spirit to prompt you to inspire you, to manifest that in you. That doesn't mean to say that everybody is going to be equally used in this gift. It seems to me, from experience, that some are used more than others. Is it because they have desired it more? Is it because they've sought God on it? Or is that just simply the Holy Spirit giving the gifts as He chooses, and that some will be used more often than others simply because that's the will of the Spirit? The Holy Spirit does give His gifts according to His will, not according to our dictates, but at the same time, you can miss it. There are many times when you could have moved in prophecy and you didn't do it because you quenched the Spirit at that particular time. And so remember, this is something that God wants you to be open to and to be zealous for. The gift of prophecy is one of the grace gifts. We call them charismata, grace gifts. The word charis is the word grace. And this means two things. It means that it comes from the mercy of God. It is freely given. And it doesn't depend so much on your righteousness, on how good a Christian you are. It depends on the Holy Spirit's anointing upon your life and His gift, the way He wants to work. It also means that this is a gracious enabling so that when you prophesy, you prophesy according to His Spirit. These are 
gifts, not rewards. They're not merit badges. I've got a gift of prophecy that shows that I, I've attended my Sunday school class. No. These are not trophies of merit or something that we boast about. These are tools, tools. They're not toys that we play with, not something for our entertainment. They are tools given by God, initiated by the Spirit, not abilities that we have and perform at will. Now in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3, it's established that the gift of prophecy is given by the Spirit so that we can build others. We can exhort others. We can encourage others and comfort them. And so there is a very real sense in which we must desire this gift and seek God to be used according to His will and the will of the Holy Spirit in it. Remember, it is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's nothing that you initiate. It's His manifestation. So on the one hand, we must stress our willingness to be used, our desire to be used, and openness to be used, and the seeking of God that we may be used, balance that also with the fact that we cannot be used ever unless the Holy Spirit does it. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. In all the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit, tongues, prophecy, all the rest of it, it has to do with the manifestation of God. If the Holy Spirit is not doing it, you cannot do it. But if the Holy Spirit is doing it, you can do it, whoever you are. And as we know, if it's the will of the Holy Spirit for you to speak in tongues, which it is, I would that you all spoke with tongues, Paul says, then you can do it. If it's the will of God for you to prophesy, all may speak, all may prophesy, then you may do it as the Holy Spirit leads on every occasion. And so remember that in prophecy, the Holy Spirit will not override your will. The gift of, the, of, the, of, the, of prophecy is subject to the one using it. In other words, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. That means your spiritual gift is subject to your will. You must choose to obey God. You must choose to respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And so this means that when we come in congregational prophecy, we should come in quiet confidence that God is going to manifest the gift of prophecy amongst us. And we can expect Him to do it and manifest it personally through us. So be ready, especially according to 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, each one has when you come together. When you come together, each one has something to offer. In other words, you come prepared. You come with your spirit prepared. You come ready to be used. You come ready to manifest whatever God wants to manifest through you. And as we're talking about prophecy, that will be uppermost in your mind, of course, right now. So our prophetic listening shouldn't start at the beginning of the service. It should start before we come to the service. We should be seeking God and saying, what are you saying today? What do you want to do today? Uh, and it's not just something for the leaders to do, it's for the whole congregation, that when you gather together, you'll be ready to, be, to move with the Holy Spirit. And then when somebody prophesies along the lines that you had already received, you can go after it and say, I confirm that I had that prophecy also. Or when the pr preacher preaches something that you was on your heart, you, it's a confirmation that you are flowing in the Spirit and the preacher is flowing in the Spirit. And so we can have this prophetic confirmation together and we know that the Spirit isn't the, the possession of any one believer but he belongs rightfully to us all as he is the gift of God to us all. We should be waiting on God throughout the week at home and at work even in our recreation. We should be ready listening to God because he will use all kinds of means to speak to us. Sheep dancing in the field, children playing in the playground, people sitting on tubes, posters that are stuck up on the wall, all different ways God will use to speak to you. And to, so when you come together in a meeting, you are prompted, ready, set up by the Holy Spirit to be used by the Spirit as He wants you to. It doesn't mean to say that if you come with something prophetic, you don't have a chance to give it, that you have necessarily quenched the Spirit. Because as we shall see, we have to yield to one another. And God may give us words to say which aren't, we don't actually have the chance to say. That doesn't mean to say that things have necessarily gone wrong. If the Lord is leading you to say it and prompting you to say it, then you ought to. But even then, it might mean that you don't get a chance to. 
because it says there that when one prophesies, the others should sit and listen. And then if the Holy Spirit touches somebody else, then the one who is speaking should yield to somebody else. So it won't be dominated by one particular person. And that shows that it is possible to come to a meeting with a prophetic burden in your heart and not have the opportunity to deliver it. But that doesn't matter because the Holy Spirit isn't just speaking through you. And it may be for another occasion anyway. Or you may just be able to t pray about it or maybe write it down and pass it to the leaders and they can share it on another occasion. And also it means that the Holy Spirit is in charge. He doesn't have to speak through you and through you alone. And so we need to see how this can be a blessing in people's lives. Now when we come to personal prophecy, we must understand that this has to be subjected to the same rigorous testing as congregational prophecy. It is prophecy given in private rather than in public. Although some private words may be given in public, uh, so long as it's not embarrassing or it's excessively personal. But you see, as God is speaking to an individual, and that is publicly shared, that can also bless everybody else. They get the overflow from it. That's why so often when we're ministering, God will give us a word of knowledge or a prophetic word for an individual. We'll call them out, prophesy over their lives. And what that means is that God is using that as an example for the rest of the body of Christ to, be, to rejoice over, to pray into, to witness to, and also to receive from, like the overflow even happens in the healing ministry. Somebody is healed publicly with a back condition and then two or three others get the overflow. They get healed as well and God set the whole thing up because he wanted to bless everybody in that particular way. Uh, sometimes uh, something can be said uh, privately in public. Somebody can be ministered to privately in public. It doesn't have to be public Public, public, it can be public, private, or private, public. But the point is this, God wants to speak personally and individually, as well as corporately and publicly to everybody. This shows us that Jesus knows our lives so perfectly, so personally, and so intimately. And in it, there is the call to embrace the Christ who lies behind that prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so where there's a prophecy, there is Jesus. And when we experience prophecy, we experience more of Jesus. And so we find that out of all of these gifts, this ministry of personal prophecy can touch people's lives in a very, very personal and wonderful way. And that brings to an end today's program on prophetic listening. And I pray that God has begun to minister to you and help you understand how you can hear from God for yourself and how you can put what he says into practice. We'll be back next time with more on prophetic listening. God bless you. Mm -hmm.